Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Conversations in Moral Theology. This is a show sponsored by New Wine, New Wineskins, an association for early career Catholic moral theologians and the Catholic Moral Theology blog. I'm Alessandro Rovati, and today I'm joined by Julie Henron Rubio, who is Associate Dean and Professor of Christian Social Ethics at the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University, and by Paul Schutz, who is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Santa Clara University. They are the authors of the recent study, Beyond Bad Apples, Understanding Clergy Perpetrated, perpetrated Sexual Abuse as a Structural Problem and Cultivating Strategies for Change. Julian Paul, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us here. So uh, let me start by asking you about the origin of Beyond Bad Apples. How did the two of you uh, become interested in this topic and what led you to working and publishing this particular study? So the study began as part of um, a grant project sponsored by Fordham University called Taking Responsibility, Jesuit Institutions Confront the Legacy of Clergy Sexual Abuse. There's more to it than that, but that's the basic idea. And uh, we were contacted by people from Fordham to consider doing a grant project out of as part of this program. And so Julie and I got together, we had lunch, and we were discussing angles on, you know, clergy perpetrated sexual abuse. How would we come at this question? How would we approach it? And I think it became clear pretty quickly in the course of this one conversation that we had that issues around clericalism, especially as they're inflected through the lens of sex and gender and power, as those things show up are interests that we share. They're, they're mutual interests between the two of us. And that we thought that those particular things had a lot to do with the reality of the endurance, you know, the fact that clergy perpetrated sexual abuse while it may have declined is not going away. And so we decided let's investigate the relationship between clericalism as a structural reality, as something that conditions and structures the entirety of life in the church and the reality of clergy sexual abuse, looking at it through these sort of different lenses of, of sex, gender, and power. So it actually came together pretty easily early on in terms of kind of what we wanted to explore and how we might explore it. Yeah, and I would just add that, that for me, at least my location at the Jesuit School of Theology at the Elegate, where we train priests and scholastics, lay people and religious sisters for ministry. I think that location shaped my desire to do this research. It really wasn't something that I had um, that I had done much work on before, although I had worked on sexual violence uh, more generally. Um, it shaped my desire to do this work and, uh, and also to, um, to respond to the post-Pennsylvania grand jury report world where, you know, once again, this was um, a moment confronting the church. I mean, after the Me Too movement, the Church Too movement, it, it's, it was a time at w when I felt that as a theologian, I could not stay silent. And I think what was attractive about the Fordham University study was that it was asking us to do more than just speak. I mean, I felt like in previous phases, of the, the scandal, um, theologians had spoken, but, but with this grant, they were really asking us to do research um, and especially interdisciplinary and empirical research so that we would really not just be analyzing from what we already knew or what we thought we knew, but, but really be covering new ground. And that was really attractive to us. So we saw an opportunity to, um, to do some pretty serious reading um, of what had already been done, but then also to, to do our, our own original study. Thank and you. I just tag on there that mm -hmm. my, my own interest also comes from 
years, about 14 years working in professional ministry in liturgy and music, being on the ground kind of amid the realities of clericalism uh, around people who uh, are, you know, were known abusers and, you know, known victims and survivors of abuse and kind of uh, living in that world. And also through a master's program that we have here at Santa Clara, training ministers who are working professionally kind of out there in the field. And that component, the sort of ministry component became a really important, uh, another sort of really important facet of the study. And we'll get more into that as, as we continue to talk. So as you described, uh, the study's main claim is that sexual abuse in the church is a systemic problem uh, linked mainly to clericalism. Uh, how would you characterize clericalism and what are its uh, salient features? Also, how does it manifest itself in the life of the church? Sure, there's, there's a ton there to unpack, I think, because really, as our study went on, it became clearer and clearer that uh, while the sort of presenting issue, to use like the medical kind of term there, for the study was clergy perpetrated sexual abuse, the sort of underlying reality that we were studying was really clericalism. And, and, and specifically, we describe it as structural clericalism, as opposed to, and maybe this is the first important, you know, clarification, differentiation, as opposed to uh, an individualized clericalism, which would be, you know, a clericalism where, you know, father's in charge or the bishop's in charge, and they, they have no need of listening to anybody else. They're just absorbed with their own status, their own position, their own authority, and they leverage that in ways through, you know, domineering personality or management styles. All of that is part of what we were looking at, but the deeper level to this, that the structural level is that we, uh, we use this analogy, the cinnamon roll, that clericalism is not something that, um, you know, can be sort of picked out of the life of the church, like a raisin in a cinnamon roll. If you don't like, you know, cinnamon raisins in your cinnamon roll, you can pull them out, right? But you can't pull the cinnamon out because then it's not a roll cinnamon roll anymore right and and so in some ways like the the sort of deeper level of the claim is that clericalism is so baked in to the whole structure of the church that it's not just about priests or clerics who kind of act a certain way in this individualized manner but also that clericalism is internalized by lay people, by religious, uh, who sort of presume that father knows best to use that phrase or to presume the status and authority of the priest, even when per perhaps they have more expertise on a question or a situation than the priest does, you know? And, and then that when these things kind of start to come together, the possibility, the conditions for the possibility of abuse are more easily met because we have deference on one side and an exaggerated sense of authority and power on the other side. Um, we'll get more into this, I know, as we go, but when this then begins to intersect with issues of gender and sex, um, all of that is just heightened even further. So that's the, that's the first thing I would say, that, that structural dimension is so important. Second thing, a little bit more simply, is just the definition. You know, we define clericalism in our study as a structure of power that sets clergy apart, places them above and apart from laity, from religious, from others, and grants them excessive rights, excessive trust, excessive authority, with all of which, you know, when they come together, um, kind of make the ground uh, unfortunately, rather ripe for abuse because of the way that these pieces of the puzzle all end up fitting together. So that's the second thing I'd add is just kind of a little bit about how we understand clericalism. I'm sure Julie can add more to that. Yeah, and I just underline that that we see it as, as a structural reality that shapes both clergy and lay people. So, um, so I think at some, some I've seen some people push back against this idea that lay people also participate in clericalism. People saying, this is not my problem. Um, this is what clergy and bishops did. But really, we think that you can't understand clericalism or its role in clergy sexual abuse without understanding that it's something that all of us imbibe. Um, and, and often even against our 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 will, our our opinions, or, or or things like that. So, you know, I've had others push back and say, you know, that's 
those kind of people over here who are clericalists were like the good guys <laughs> and, and that's not us, but our contention is that this is something that if it shapes the whole of ecclesial life, then it, then it, it is, it is in us, um, despite our best intentions in both lay people and clergy shaping our interactions. And part of what we needed to do in the study was, was, was show um, where it was manifest so that we could become aware and then work against it. And just to tag that on the, the, the priest thing, this is the case, even if a priest refuses clericalism or doesn't mm -hmm. want to be clericalist, it doesn't mean that clericalism isn't still there, sort of haunting the background of the situation, because that priest, as anti-clericalist or as whatever as he might be, um, can't change the perceptions of every single person in the pews and the sort of clericalist assumptions that they might bring. Those are still there, even if he himself is actively resisting uh, the reality. And so it takes a sort of coming together. And that's what we mean when we say structural. It's the background and it's invisible and it's there all the time, even when it's being resisted, which is why it needs to be resisted so strongly. So at various points in your study, you describe that engaging in the critique of clericalism does not mean to oppose the priesthood or to demonize individual priests. And furthermore, uh, you argue that it is important to distinguish between ordination, which is a gift to the church, and clericalism. Yet, Embodying such distinctions and striking the right balance can be difficult, especially in the heated debates that surround such fraught issues. Would you reflect on uh, this tension, which is in part at the heart of your work a little bit? For sure. I think it kind of starts where our last answer ended um, in this idea that, you know, because clericalism is something that we're describing as structural, it is the this invisible backdrop. It's always there, right? And so it needs to be resisted. Now, historically, clericalism and ordination have often and still in the present day have been really closely intertwined in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases. But one of the great insights that we came to from analyzing our data is that Priesthood is not just about status and power or even about ministerial function. It is also about empowerment, the sort of outward flowing um, work that brings the gifts that the Spirit has given to every member of the church as baptized Christians uh, to the fullness of who they can be and to the fullness of how they can contribute. And that that necessarily kind of involves a diminishment of sort of, you know, I must decrease so he may increase kind of idea here, or that they may increase, that there's this rich collaboration, this rich sort of growth together that can happen through priestly ministry when it is exercised in its fullest way as the cultivation of of all of the Spirit's gifts for the whole church. That's very different from a clericalist understanding of priesthood, wherein the priest is the top-down, you know, purveyor of sacraments or the conveyor of grace, right? We get some of this language in historical documents um, that the priest is the go-between between, between God and the, the lay people or between God and the, the rest of the church. When that is the understanding, we get that really close entwinement of the priesthood as a function in the church and this clericalist paradigm. And so I guess what we're proposing in the end is that while that has and remains, maybe the dominant kind of the clericalist understanding of priesthood is still dominant, I think, in a lot of places, um, it, that clericalism is not inherent in ordination itself but is a harmful, twisted, we might even say, contorted form of what priesthood is meant to be that overemphasizes the priest's status and authority and underemphasizes the priest's uh, work as a person who is chosen not only by God, but also by the community to serve and to grow and to empower and to sort of do the work of the spirit in a local Catholic community. And so we want to kind of pull those apart in a new way and say, we have this gift of ordination and here's what it is and here's what it can do and what it does do in many cases when, you know, priests operate in these ways. 
Uh, and also, on the other hand, that there is this other form, which maybe has been more prevalent, which needs to be resisted and undone. Sure. And, and I mean, I think it's it's really important to both of us that, you know, we we both, I mean, I'm associate dean at a school which is made up of mostly priests and people who are studying to, uh, for the priesthood. And Paul works in his ministry um, with lots of priests as well. Um, yeah, we want to be understood as not anti-priest. Uh, and and we also want to be understood as, but though, as as people who um we're, we're, we're not afraid of critiques that implicate us. Um, so in, in, you know, as, as a white person, I have to understand that systemic racism shapes me and not be afraid of that discussion. Um, we have to understand, men have to understand how sexism understands them. And also women have to understand how internalized sexism shapes us. Uh, in the same way, I don't think priests need to fear uh, discussions about clericalism. This is a systemic reality. They benefit from it. They also, um, many of them would, would like less of it around. And, and they'll have, to, and, and uh, I mean, I think one of the most encouraging responses I've received is, you know, when I presented this to my own faculty, um, you know, they're, once they understood, uh, the, the priest on their faculty understood what I was getting at, they're like, yes, um, this is the kind of priest I want to be, and I want to be anti-clericalist, that's the term we use, um, just in the same way that I want to be anti-racist. And I know that's not, and that that is a way of of living into the kind of priesthood that I want. So, um, as you mentioned, this is an interdisciplinary study, which means that uh, you have engaged in it not only based on theological uh, presumptions, but engaging even and using uh, some a sociological uh, approach uh, and, and a number of sociological theories that have to do with the reality of sex, gender, and power. Um, now, the sociological approach you chose uh, is not without critics. Uh, for example, uh, you also refer to this in your study, uh, the sociological school known as critical realism and the Catholic theologians who follow it uh, would take issue with what they would perceive as an overly deterministic vision of the relationship between structures and individual agency that uh, uh, the sociological approach you, you choose uh, seem to entail. Uh, would you talk more about your understanding of the interactions between structures and individuals and also about how your commitments do not stand against fundamental human realities such as agency and freedom. How would you respond to the critique that your approach is too deterministic? Mm. Yeah, that's a great, we, that was a fine line that we walked through this entire, you know, uh, study as we were kind of trying to get into the sociological theories, we constantly felt ourselves pushed and pulled by sort of the, you know, approach of Pierre Bourdieu, you know, which says, much, which is much more focused on the structure and the determinism of structures. And then other folks, you know, Margaret Archer, William Sewell, who Dan Finn picks up and works with uh, having this more critical realist approach. And I think that, you know, where we emerge, the end game is that we find ourselves somewhat in a middle position between them uh, because one of the things that I think my own sort of engagement with this comes from engagement with structural racism and theory around structural racism in particular, um, is that one of the most important categories or descriptors for a structure or a system as we're calling it, um, is, is its association with the status quo. And, and I think that that piece is really where the sort of more deterministic or structural approach of Bourdieu is really helpful. Um, and continental philosophy in general kind of thinks in, in these terms a lot. You know, that whenever we're thinking about the question of the extent to which things are determined, we have to always look at the status quo and ask, why is the status quo the way that it is, right? And so if the, if the status quo in the church is clericalist, or at least predisposed towards clericalism, why is it the case? What are the sort of sedimented historical realities that have gotten us to this point at which the default setting or the status quo of ecclesial life 
tends toward clericalism, not only on the part, again, I want to make, keep emphasizing this distinction, not only on the part of individual priests who are acting in a clericalist ways, it, a way, but also in terms of the assumptions, the thoughts, all of those things that every member of the church brings into the church when they see a priest up there presiding at the Eucharist or when they enter a confessional or when they go into a finance meeting at a parish, right? What are the assumptions that are being brought into the room? And I would argue that in many cases, those assumptions, if not deterministic, are at least very persuasive, you know, very, they, they assert influence on the situation. They sort of ask for deference to the priest. They ask for this culture of respect. And the question then becomes, if a person has never thought critically about the reality that there is this sort of unseen pressure to conform to this clericalist paradigm, if a person has never encountered that, questioned it, interrogated it, most likely they are gonna simply conform themselves to the status quo. And so in the same way that, you know, a lot of racial justice folks, uh, a lot of, you know, critical race theorists will say, you know, the status quo of American society is white supremacy. And it's so baked in and so invisibilized that it has to constantly be resisted. We are saying in many ways, the status quo of ecclesial life is clericalism. And so if there is to be agency, let me shift over to that now, the first step toward that is raising consciousness about the status quo of clericalism. So it's not deterministic in the sense that there is no agency. We think people do have agency, but we are so often blinded. I think the average Catholic, and you know, I grew up as an average Catholic before I ever, you know, thought about being anything like a theologian. You know, the average Catholic is so um, deep in the water. This is the water we swim in. We're so deep in that water, right? That we can't even see how clericalist or the way that clericalism is working and shaping reality around us. And so while that part tends toward determinism with consciousness raising, what uh, Margaret Archer calls it reflexivity, um, right? The cultivation of this ref self-reflexive consciousness, there is the possibility of increased agency, including agency that resists that pressure that the status quo is always putting on people as they're moving in ecclesial spaces. And so that is kind of where we ended up recognizing that. And I think this is one last little point that, you know, the church is largely a medieval hierarchical institution, you know, and it still has all the trappings of its history kind of built in and baked into it. And so while in society, we might be talking about democracy and liberation movements and, you know, all of these kinds of things, there's also a degree to which we're not quite there in a lot of ecclesial spaces and that we need for that ecclesial conversation to move in this direction that actually acknowledges um, agency, the agency of lay people as priest, prophet, and king by virtue of their baptism and, and lifts that up and celebrates it and empowers it and brings it to, you know, its, its fullest flourishing uh, in service of the life of the church rather than relying on this sort of status quo presumption of clerical status and authority. And so that to me is kind of the horizon for where um, some of the thinking about this relationship goes. I would just add, I mean, I think we agree with Finn and other ethicists who are embracing critical realism that a purely deterministic sociology can't be reconciled with Catholic understandings of human freedom, right? And, and that, you know, so, so that there has to be a sociolog sociological theory of structures with room for the tension between structures and agency. And, uh, and definitely our our data showed us that that people are that ecclesial, despite the sort of the overall structure, people are already moving in different ways in these in these spaces. Uh, and some space, not all spaces are the same. Not all, just because there are church or parishes or schools or whatever. There's more space to move and. Um, some, some places than others. Um, and so, and there's no potential for that. So that our recommend, so I think maybe some overly structural analyses of clericalism in the church come away thinking, well, there's no hope for the church or the only hope is to sort of blow the whole thing up. And uh, I, I'd say that our conclusions are more modest 
And we, um, the things, the kinds of things that we suggest at the end are things that we actually think um, can be achieved. Yeah, and I'll certainly ask you to, to talk more about uh, those. Uh, to stay again here in, in, the, in the place of tension, if you will, um, uh, in the study you explicitly uh, criticize as limited uh, approaches to clergy perpetrated sexual abuse uh, that focus uh, exclusively uh, on the individual realities uh, of personal weakness or maybe vulnerability or maybe poor training or maybe sin even. Uh, yet, again, aren't these an important part of the Catholic imagination, of the Catholic language, uh, an important part of the picture? Uh, do you think we need to choose between your approach and others that are more attentive to individual factors or is an integration, common ground, to use an expression that is dear to Julie, uh, possible? I think that common ground is possible and it's desirable it's, and it's where we you know, should, should be orienting ourselves. I, I think that the the issue that we see with those sort of very specific factors being associated uh, directly with clergy perpetrated sexual abuse is that abuse is not reducible to any one of those factors. And in fact, whenever we over individualize the reality of abuse, we miss the broader context. Um, and Julie can say more about this, especially as far as gender based violence and, and sexual violence go. But we miss the broader context. And one of the you know, foci that we're looking at of that broader context is this, this structural clericalism, is this backdrop, right? So there may be uh, inadequate formation, but we would say, you know, just as much as we need formation for celibacy or healthy sexual integration, we also need healthy personal integration for priests so that they are not falling into this sort of clericalist practices that are all too readily available for them. I mean, we, you know, we talk a lot about incentives and enablements. Those incentives and enablements are right there in front of priests in many cases. And they're right there in front of lay people too, who can accept the incentives that they receive to participate in clericalism and maintain that status quo. And so it's really an issue, I think, for me, first of all, of reducibility, that Clergy perpetrated sexual abuse cannot be reduced to any single factor, but it has to be looked at sort of, you know, in a constellation type way. We have to gaze up at the stars and see how they all together, you know, make the shape that encloses the reality of clergy perpetrated sexual abuse. And I think the other thing that I would say with respect to our theory of clericalism too, is that in some ways clericalism operates, and I think we kind of get into this in our data a little bit as a, as a superstructure that encloses many of those different facets. So clericalism is nourished and enabled by sexual repression. Clericalism is, is nourished and enabled by uh, inadequate formation for the priesthood. Uh, you know, it is, um, it, it, it can entail all of those things. And so what I think structural analysis brings to the table is this ability to sort of look at the constellation rather than the individual star. And that's what we're trying to do is kind of look at that broader network of causes and conditions and factors that um, predisposes situations to abuse as opposed to saying, with our bad apples, right? That, you know, say father so-and-so is a bad apple and here's what's wrong with him. And if that weren't wrong with him, then he wouldn't have committed abuse. I think that's overly simplistic and overly individualistic. And so we wanna kind of look at that broader network of factors a little bit more fully. Yeah, I, I, I think what worries us is that an individual focus is not broad enough to actually root out abuse. And, and so in the same way that if I were um, on a college campus trying to deal with sexual violence, I would not just be looking for, for those bad apples, those really bad guys. Um, I, would, I would need to look structurally at the campus to see what was going on structurally, how men and women were relating to each other, what is the sexual landscape, what is the gendered landscape, because that sexual violence uh, those who study sexual violence tell us is what 
lays the groundwork that enables sexual violence to occur at a higher level on a college campus than it does elsewhere. And the same thing is true in the church. We won't get to the roots of it unless we look at the structural issues. And, and then, you know, as a moral theologian, I want to say we can still talk about sin. Um, wouldn't want to stop talking about sin. I mean, uh, Dan Finn has done a great job of talking about how structures themselves are sinful. But I think so much good work has, has been done in moral theology in recent years as well on how our complicity or cooperation or whatever it is, we, word we want to use with sinful social structures can also be sinful. Um, so I didn't. Yeah. So I don't I don't think that using a structural approach approach um, lets us off the hook, actually, from sin at all. So one of your central claims is that clergy perpetrated sexual abuse is made possible by problematic understandings of masculinity and unhealthy ways of living masculinity uh, among priests. I personally thought that it was one of the most uh, thought-provoking parts of your reflection. Uh, would you please talk a bit about it? Why don't, you, why don't you take the lead on this one, Julie? Sure. Uh, so so one of our contentions is, is that gender is a part of the structure of clericalism. And, and um, whenever I talk about that in a group, it seems controversial, um, which is odd when we think about you know, that all of, all of the perpetrators in the church um, of clergy sexual abuse are male. Um, it seems odd that we wouldn't look at that factor. And of course, it is true that the vast majority of perpetrators of sexual violence generally are men, although there are certainly cases and even cases in the church of women who abuse. Um, so, so why, right? I, and we have to ask that question. Why is it that men are more prone to use sexual violence to dominate um, and harm? And um, what we learn from sexual violence theorists is that masculinity, ways of conceiving and practicing or um, living out masculinity um, are, are linked to sexual violence. Um, so when we have stronger forms of it, masculinity as domination, um, as, uh, as conquest, um, then those are problematic. Um, priests are in an interesting position because um, in some ways they have a lot of power and in some ways they, they lack uh, certain ways of living out masculinity that are, that are understood to be powerful. So they can have, a, um, they could um, fall into a category that some of our researchers talked about as a contested masculinity. So a group of men who might have to prove their masculinity in non-traditional ways, which may make them more prone to sexual violence. So this is a theory, um, but I, I, but I think a particular theory. But I think one, what what is pretty uncontroversial is that masculinity has something to do with sexual violence. And Paul, you can say more. Yeah, I might just add that, you know, that same literature that we're talking about, which was a huge part of the lit review that we did, you know, indicates that um, hierarchical and male dominated organizations are themselves also have this predisposition toward violence. Um, there's evidence that shows that. And we have, you know, in the Catholic priesthood, a 100% male, you know, uh, institution. And I, I think that we can't let go of that fact. I mean, it's, it's just, just the way things are. And so we're dealing with this hyper hierarchical and hyper masculine, you know, institution that at the same time, as Julie said, often engages with masculinity in a way that that is sort of a, a subordinate form of masculinity to traditional, you know, uh, sort of macho types of machismo types of masculinity. Um, and, and that can lead when there is, especially if sexual repression or inadequate sexual formation, formation for celibacy, um, church teaching on homosexuality, I mean, all of this kind of comes into the puzzle there under this umbrella of masculinity. And in, in many ways, we, we would contend that it could potentially feed, feed the fire that, that leads to abuse. Um, and that, that in some ways, the ecclesial space 
because of all of these factors and the way that they interlock um, has a sort of predisposition that, that needs to be looked at a little bit more carefully. And these studies of masculinity and sexual violence can tell us a lot um, by comparison about what's going on in situations of clergy perpetrated sexual abuse. I think this this is an important space because I don't think we've said this yet to make sure that we underline that we're not making causal arguments, right? Yes. That, right. Um, so that so that we're um, we're we're looking at correspondences. There there is more higher prevalence of sexual violence in certain kinds of environments. So if if the church has some of the characteristics of of those environments, then we need to look critically at those characteristics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we're not claiming statistical correlation or causation. Our data does not show that, but uh, we, we think that there is a demonstrable correspondence or coherence between what the literature is telling us, what our survey respondents said, and uh, everything else that we found in sort of the theological and ethical research we've done as well. So talking about correspondences, uh, and we go back then to more indiv individualized ways of explaining sexual abuse in the church, uh, two uh, correlations that many Catholics uh, from different positions, ecclesial positions make, are the correlation between uh, abuse and celibacy on the one hand, and abuse and homosexuality on the other end. Uh, you think that these links are uh, false or better. Uh, you understand the link between the reality of abuse and the ones of celibacy and homosexuality in ways that are fundamentally different from, again, how uh, that link is understood uh, by these positions that I uh, uh, referred to. Uh, could you articulate your understanding of the link between abuse homosexuality, celibacy. Sure, yeah. The link that we see, and I appreciate you, you presented that in a very nuanced way, thank you. Yeah, the the way that we see this link is not this sort of unidirectional or simplistic causality, like, you know, gay priests are the reason, you know, and people will make the argument out there in the world, you know, the majority of perpetrators and the majority of victim survivors are male. Therefore, this is a homosexual act. Therefore, homosexuality is the problem, right? Or celibacy causes people to repress their sexuality. This is a form of acting out, et cetera. So we acknowledge that, you know, the, the, those circumstantial pieces of evidence that we're talking about are true. Um, you know, that that the, the, those things are accurate, but we reject the idea that there's a sort of simplistic AB causal relationship between them. And the reason for that is that we would argue that if we're looking at this structurally and we're looking at it in dialogue with sexual violence literature and gender literature, what we see kind of going back to the masculinity idea is that it's not homosexuality or celibacy per se that's the issue. It is the culture of silence and repression and inadequate formation and preparation for living a healthy, you know, sexually integrated and personally integrated life as a priest, that is the issue because, and here's the evidence, right? The evidence is the, is the, the, the many priests out there who have achieved this level of sexual integration and who even in taking our survey articulated beautiful definitions and visions of what healthy sexual and personal integration looks like. And it is possible for a person to live a well-integrated celibate life. That is very possible. But when these other structural factors come into play, for example, with homosexuality, you know, the church teaching officially says that there shall be no gay men in the seminary. You know, there shall be no gay priests. We know that that's not the case, you know, uh, with, with very careful, you know, caution about overstating this, 40% of the priests and uh, other ordained people who took our survey identified as homosexual or bisexual. Now that's limited to our survey. That can't be generalized. That's not saying 40% of everyone, but 40% of the priest respondents, nearly a hundred people, 40 of nearly a hundred people um, identified in that way. And so whatever the statistic actually is, we know that the reality is there. And if you imagine the situation of a young seminarian 
who knows himself to be gay, who knows himself to be homosexual, enters the seminary and is told again and again and again and again, you have to keep that a secret. You have to keep that quiet. If your formator finds out that, you know, you're gay, you're going to be out. But this person has uh, encountered and experienced an authentic call to the priesthood at the same time. Those things are going to exist in a fundamental tension that the current state of church teaching on homosexuality doesn't allow for a resolution of that tension because homosexuality always is the thing to be excluded from seminary life. And so then the documents go on to, you know, describe homosexuality as a form of immaturity that can be overcome. And if this immaturity in a person is overcome, they will attain heterosexuality. The language is something like that. Now, this runs counter to all social scientific and scientific literature on sexuality, but it is what the church presents as the teaching. And uh, so our framing is much more, let's think about that in terms of the intense repression that a person has to sort of undertake in order to conform himself to the sort of guidelines that are here. Let's think about the formation that doesn't really allow for, there is no formation toward the sexual integration of a homosexual person, except insofar as they can achieve the maturity in heterosexuality. So the actual sort of integration of a person that identifies, understands themselves to be gay is not even on the table in terms of how the church understands these things. Again, compounding those effects of repression and um, those things. When you add to that, maybe on the celibacy side, you know, the tradition of teaching repression and sublimation as strategies for dealing with one's sexuality, um, there's, you know, pretty good evidence that sexual repression, you know, actually makes abuse more likely. And so we wanna again say, yeah, we could look at these individual circumstances and say there's this sort of causal or correlative link between the two kind of things. But the reality is that when we're dealing in the church, we're dealing with a much broader and more complicated network of causes and conditions and teachings and practices and all of these kinds of things that promote forms of repression that ultimately are, according to the sexual violence literature, predisposed toward the possibility of abuse. And we're not able to even ask those questions or contend with those things because, at least in the case of homosexuality, it's not even on the table to begin with. So there's sort of a, a bunch of issues in play there, but we want that more nuanced, more complicated kind of look rather than the simple AB causal link that a lot of folks will make, um, although we recognize the sort of presenting issues that are associated there too. So I think it kind of sets us apart from those people who'd want to say um, on the progressive side, celibacy is the problem, but that doesn't make sense because the vast majority of perpetrators of sexual violence generally are, are not priests or not celib committed to celibacy. Um, and then, or people who want to say it's homosexuality, uh, because again, the vast majority of perpetrators are not gay men, and there's no evidence that gay men are more likely to abuse. Uh, and also, most studies of sexual abuse show that that when a perpetrator chooses a victim of the same sex, that's not evidence that that person has a deep-rooted sexual orientation, same-sex sexual orientation. Rather, the, most perpetrators are are generalists who choose victims based on proximity, um, access. So, so the simplistic arguments don't pan out, but then some people want to say these are not factors at all, and we disagree with them in, in that we believe they are factors, but as part of this broader system that Paul is talking about. Let me, um, let me ask uh, a follow-up, Julie. Uh, so you were mentioning how research on sexual abuse uh, reflects on proximity and access as, as, the, main, uh, as the main features uh, that perpetrators are looking in victims. Uh, I think part of the reason why, again, there is a vast majority of Catholics, or at least many Catholics who link uh, the issue of homosexuality with abuse is that we now have uh, varied, various studies of abuse on minors uh, in which, again, there's, there is that seeming correlation. 
between abuse and same-sex uh, attraction. Um, and yet, uh, uh, what those studies don't, don't include is uh, uh, sexual abuse on adults. And it seems to me that uh, probably that's the part of the picture that we don't have, at least in, in, with the kind of statistical analysis that things like the John Jay report did for abuse of minors. It seems that that's the part of the picture that maybe would complicate, add, uh, support some of the things that uh, you and Paul are saying in this study. Absolutely. Uh, so, so the access point um, for us means that that priests have have generally had more access to boys um, just because you're more comfortable with, you know, sending your son um, with a priest than your daughter. Um, that would be true more generally. Um, so the access has been there when we think about altar boys. Um, but, um, but yeah, if you look at the broader picture of abuse, it's not clear at all that it, when we're done studying this, whenever we're done, or, um, we're, we're going to see that same pattern of majority being men and boys. Um, even in the John Jay study, 80% of those who are identified as perpetrators said that they had also, um, I, I believe the ter they used the term been in sexual relationship or what we would say sexually violated um, adults because of their position. Um, so, so they're, you know, so we already know <laughs> that most of these perpetrators who perpetrated on minors also um, were, um, were, were doing this to adults. And we have not, none of the studies in the church and none of the current reporting structures are, 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 are dealing with this broader reality. We are starting to see in, in studies from other countries that much of the abuse is of women religious, of, of women. And certainly we have narrative accounts and qualitative studies of, um, of priests abusing women in particular. We're, we're begin we, the McCarrick study talks about seminarians. I think we're just beginning to, to understand that. So if we broaden this um, to understand um, adults, then I think then we're going to see a different picture. I think part of that actually is is the church, along with the rest of the society, understanding that we cannot call these um, instances relationships or affairs. Uh, we need to call them abuse. And I think just as society is starting to recognize this, so too the churches. Or it's not it's not a violation of of your vows. I mean. Yes, and <laughs> right, and it, it, it's it's a violation of a person and it's harm. So as we grow in that understanding, and with um, with the Vatican also uh, encouraging us now to broaden the reach to vulnerable adults, and also um, broadening the definition of vulnerable to include power relations. I think we're going to be in better, a better position to understand the broader reach of abuse. And we'll see again, um, this is not a homosexual issue at all. Yeah. So um, you mentioned how sexual integration and the lack thereof is at the heart of, uh, of the problem, is, is one of the factors at the heart of the problem of abuse. And in describing what sexual integration uh, should look like, would look like, you, you focus on three uh, elements, on three features. Uh, you mention uh, vulnerability, intimacy, and boundaries. But as you reflect on these three, uh, you talk about how these are goods, all three of them are goods, that sometimes are in tension with one another. Uh, and, and, and accordingly, sexual integration is not always... Uh, easy. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, could you reflect a little more on uh, those three goods, why you chose those three, and also the tension among them, how to navigate, navigate the tension among them? Sure. So we found, you know, we make a distinction between vulnerability and connecting uh, in, our, in our data. And these were the two sort of modes of clergy 
per, a clergy other person relationships that kind of kept showing up. Connecting is much more of a sort of superficial greet people at the door, you know, how's your kids, you know, that kind of thing, uh, you know, that we see often um, in priests. And, you know, we would argue that one of the reasons why these three goods, vulnerability, intimacy, and, and boundaries are so important is because they first and foremost, humanize the priest, or they allow, we might maybe flip that around and say, they allow the priest to be fully human before, you know, the congregation or before whomever it is that the priest works with in the same way that all people are called to be fully human and fully integrated as persons. And for a priest that includes their sexuality. You know, one of the issues that we face is that priestly sexuality is always sort of shrouded in mystery or under the cone of silence, you know, and, and what that does is it sort of precludes the possibility of authentic vulnerability. Now we're not saying priests need to be open about, you know, their sexuality with everybody and they should just be, you know, banding around whatever, but there should be relationships for a person who is fully integrated. There should be relationships that are vulnerable enough for a person to sort of look at that part of themselves and talk about that part of themselves and talk about struggles with that part of themselves. And this might happen among priests, but we also would contend that it can in some circumstances happen between priests and lay people or priests and religious, whatever it might be. But it really is rooted, I think, in the sort of a deeper conception of friendship and a deeper conception of relationship, which all of the documents on the priesthood, when they talk about celibacy and sexual integration, they emphasize the importance of authentic friendship. But one of the things that we kind of see as a barrier and associate with clericalism is that this sort of walling off of sexuality, this walling off of sex, not only causes sort of a lack of sexual integration or makes sexual integration more difficult for the priest internally in his own life, it also builds up or thickens, we might say, the wall that stands between priests and other people in the church, married couples, for example, who are having sex with each other as part of their relationship. And that can, again, become a function of how cler clergy, priests in particular, not deacons, but priests in particular are set above and apart from other people in the church because celibacy can be associated with heightened holiness. And it sort of feeds the cycle, perpetuates the cycle of those symptoms of clericalism that we've been talking about. So we think that authentic vulnerability and intimacy on the one hand can kind of be strategies of resisting that clericalist sort of separation and also serve the fuller, more, and I would say holier even integration of the priest as a beloved you know, creature of God, as a beloved child of God, um, who, who is a sexual person and needs to know that and needs to like deal with that in his celibate life. That can stand in tension with this third pole, this third good that you named uh, boundaries, right? How do we navigate that then within the appropriate boundaries? Well, that is the tension. And I think that tension is generative in the sense that it, it kind of asks both you know, not just priests, but also lay people, religious, whoever it is, to be really thoughtful and really careful about the relationships that they form and to be really discerning in how vulnerable those relationships can be. Because we know the sort of shadow side of some of this is that in some cases, vulnerability, false vulnerability really can be exploited as an instrument to groom someone for abuse you know, to sort of say, oh, I relate to that. Oh, I feel that. I know where you're coming from can be a way of getting closer in this really insidious way that ultimately, you know, leads to a situation of abuse. And that's why boundaries have to be there because there has to be that appropriateness. But we really do think that the vulnerability and intimacy that you've named are so crucial to the big picture of personal and sexual integration, both for priests and for priests in relationship to others. And without that, it's really difficult to imagine an end to clericalism, uh, much less an end to abuse. I mean, it seems like such an integral part of the puzzle. Yeah, and I'll just say that I, I think that this is backed up by recent studies on the priesthood, um, uh, concerns about isolation, about loneliness, and that are really concerning. Um, when we think about um, um, vulnerability to abuse and better studies on celibacy that suggest that 
um, priests are going to be in better off if they have some places of intimate and vulnerable friendship where they are able to be their full selves and and not this uh, and not always above and apart from others. Um, and I, I was actually heartened to see in the recent Catholic University um, study on uh, on seminarians that uh, and priests that that they um, that most said that they found their greatest support not from bishops, which was concerning to bishops, um, but from lay people. And, and I thought, actually, that's that's not a bad finding. I hope that priests are finding deep relationships, um, friendships with lay people where they can really share. And I've seen. Um, I see that um, here at, at JST because we have an environment where lay people and priests train alongside each other. And we do think that that kind of environment is healthier. And, I, and, and we had that intuition before we started. And I'd say that our study um, lent, lends support to that as um, people who came from Jesuit institutions tended to tell us that they were in a better place with respect to those kinds of issues and something that we'd hope to see other seminaries and schools of ministry um, follow. As I was reading uh, the, the paragraphs on sexual integration and as I hear the two of you talking, I cannot but think of some of the other things uh, you, Julie, in particular uh, are working on when it comes to fa family ethics, sexual ethics, it seems that again, uh, this sexual integration that the two of you argue is so important in the context of uh, clergy abuse, it's actually very important in the Christian life in general, and it's a sort of uh, challenge someone uh, that, that the whole church need to respond to. Uh, would you maybe say a word about that, Julie? <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, sexual integration is kind of a strong, a strange word for most people outside of cemetery, seminaries. <laughs> um, but actually, what it, it, it's a good concept. I mean, just the idea that 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 sex is integrated with with everything that I am, with my body and spirit, mind, um, with all parts of me, uh, and and yes, married and single Christians also need to think about this as a concept. And I, we've had some great conversations in my family ethics class that I teach here at JST when, where we have, you know, people who are single, engaged, married, divorced, and scholastic and priests all having that conversation together in a way that is pretty impossible. Um, it's a unique space in the church, I think, but it, it does seem to me that we could create, it could and should create more spaces for those kinds of conversations. Um, if, if we, um, the more that we talk about sex, not just as, um, in terms of norms and principles and yeses and nos, but, but in terms of virtue, uh, then the, the more those kinds of conversations make sense in, in, in all these different realms. And I might just tag on that, you know, naming that sex is just a part of what it means to be human, you know, in that broader sense, you know, just to sort of naming that, putting it on the table and talking about it in ways that are meaningful and productive. So often there's so much silence around sex. And so all these conversations that we're talking about are really, we're trying to resist that impulse to say, we don't talk about sex, you know, in the church. And, and we really, we really don't except negatively often, you know, um, but, but to have a real sort of sex positive Catholicism, sex positive, you know, kind of thing, um, you know, within the boundaries of, you know, the norms and virtues and all the things that Julie's talking about. Um, we just think that that could be really, really, really powerful and nurturing and, and good for the church. So you say that your work is practical at its core, that is, uh, it is oriented toward the transformation of ecclesial structures and institutions uh, so that the church might become a safer, healthier, holier place. What are some of the most effective practices and strategies that contribute to this uh, uh, safer, healthier, holier uh, church? Mm -hmm. 
So in broad strokes, I'll say kind of tongue in cheek, the opposite of everything we've been talking about for the last hour. Um, you know, we name this sort of broad thing anti-clericalism. And we, we say that if we want to have a safer and holier and healthier kind of place, if the church is to be that, and a place, you know, just to keep in mind that, you know, ultimately we're talking about the reduction of clergy perpetrated sexual abuse here, an end to it would be the sort of eschatological goal that we're talking about in all of this, you know? Um, that is that is the kind of bedrock of why it's practical. It's because we're talking about real things that happen in real people's lives in ecclesial spaces. And we're also, with the clericalism stuff, talking about the dynamics that what of what goes on every day, day in, day out, in parishes, in schools, in universities, in all of these kinds of places. People are, as Julie said earlier, already actively resisting the sort of incentives and enablements and things that come with accepting that clericalist status quo and working in ways, uh, working to disrupt it in ways that open up new conversations, new spaces for dialogue, those kinds of things. So, you know, concretely, when, we, when the rubber hits the road, um, I'll, I'll give my own example, and I know Julie has some of hers. I, you know, come from a background as a liturgical minister. I'm, I'm a liturgist by training first before I was a theologian, musician my whole life. And um, I'm really interested in this question of how clericalism shows up in our liturgical spaces. And I'm not, you know, and so to me, this is both about things like architecture. Um, where is the altar placed? How is it positioned? How high is the pedestal? Where does the priest stand? Where does the priest sit? Uh, you know, does the priest, is the priest, you know, positioned in such a way that it seems that he is part of the body of Christ gathered with the people? Or is he set literally above and apart as he is in most spaces? And how does that then relate to this reality of clericalism? You know, what what difference would it make if the priest sat in the front pew with the people, you know, or if perhaps the assembly, liturgical assembly, were formed to recognize that let us pray, you know, before each of the colics, let us pray does not mean stand up, but it's actually an invitation for the whole community to offer its prayers in silence, which are then offered together with the priest. That's an issue of formation, of liturgical formation. But what it also does at the same time is that it disrupts this sort of clericalist, you know, uh, paradigm of the priest being the sort of MC of the mass, you know, overseeing the whole thing that's going on and says, we are doing something actively together. Uh, and that, that your prayer, my prayer are one prayer that's being offered together. There, there are lots of ways to think about um, how liturgically you know, in our practices and things like this, we could um, disrupt some of these things. Uh, a second one that I'll just mention is that in communities, one of the big fo focal points of our study is power, uh, along with sex and gender on the power thing. Um, power raises the question of expertise and it raises the question of decision making in, in Catholic institutions. So, you know, most priests are not trained to be budget managers. Most priests, you know, except in maybe in a very basic way, they're not economists, they're not investors, they're not uh, carpenters, you know, they're not uh, professional chefs, whatever it is that they're not, right? But so often because of this sort of structural clericalist status quo, again, we're not saying that it's about the individual priest doing this, it's about the system. You know, that the system is predisposed toward making the priest the final decision maker on many topics that he might not actually have the knowledge or the training or the capacity to actually be a good decision maker about these things. But guess what? Out there in that congregation of 200 people, there are accountants, there are investors, there are musicians, there are cooks, there's whatever you need. They're all right there, right? And so an invitation toward this sort of power sharing, I mean, is one way to talk about it, but really collective discernment and decision making also already disrupts the sort of clericalist status quo. Because, and many of our priest respondents said, they don't wanna be making these decisions. They know there's people out there that can make better decisions than they can, but they don't know how to create a space where that's not the case. Well, create the space, you know, start having those conversations, make an invitation. These are the kinds of things where, you know, delegation, collective decision-making, those are other very practical strategies that in schools, 
parishes, other institutions can uh, both make a, make for a better institution and disrupt clericalism at the same time. And I think in most cases, those two things do go together. Yeah, and so I think um, if we look at the other two planks of our study on sex and gender, we've already talked a bit about how we think that creating spaces for frank conversations about sex is important in different 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 ecclesial spaces, institutions, um, but um, so that priests are not sort of left alone to to um, to work out how how to live a celibate life, but given tools and support, um, and then. Um, with regard to gender, most of the best research, again, on this suggests that it's not super effective to give people sexual violence training year after year and say, don't do this, don't do that. Um, what, what's, what's helpful, <laughs> it, it is getting, getting men and women to reflect on gender scripts that might be internalized and, um, and might incentivize um, either perpetration or, or victimhood with regard to sexual violence. And so um, given that there's very little of that kind of conversation about gender right now going on in seminaries, in parishes, um, we've heard a little bit going on in high schools um, and college and universities, that's encouraging, but, um, but surely there could be more of that kind of thing. So as we learn more about gender and its relation to sexual violence, um, then we're in a better position to actually disenable clergy perpetrated sexual abuse. And I'll just say too that if, if the kinds of things that Paul is talking about with regard to power sound um, unimaginable or pie in the sky or something, uh, depending on your local Catholic parish, uh, I serve on the National Review Board, which is a board of lay experts who um, advise and, and to some extent review um, the USCCB's efforts uh, with regard to CPSA. And one of the things that the staff, um, the bishop staff uh, on this issue are doing is trying to encourage what they call the um, high reliability organizational principles in parish life. And these high reliability organizational principles are things like, like best practices of management and power sharing and expertise and oversight and um, an assessment, right? These kinds of things, um, which sound really simple and are not, they're not super theological maybe, um, but actually they are um, they are effective and they are possible and they are necessary as we have fewer priests to who who could run everything even if we thought that was a good idea. So and and ultimately we think you know all of these things do have a theological foundation. That is that that the practices that we're recommending do flow from better understandings of sex, gender, and power that, that we should want to integrate into our ecclesial life. Let me close uh, with a more personal question. Um, in an especially powerful and moving part of the study, at least moving to me, uh, you say that you engaged in this painful and difficult work for our good and the good of God's holy church. How did the work change you? How has it shaped your spirituality, your sense of vocation as a theologian, your way of belonging to the church? For I assume one cannot do this kind of work and leave it unchanged. No, that's, that's a great question. And I think we've been working so hard, or at least I've been working so hard that I haven't really had too much time to reflect on this. So I appreciate you asking the question. I, I think that, you know, doing this work has been difficult because I think it has shined light for me, which I always, you know, on things that I always knew were there and I was aware of, and I had even encountered in my ministry work and things like this, but that I hadn't looked at so closely, you know, and it was like putting a microscope on the, you know, bacteria that you never really want to know is like there, you know, or something like that. And, and that can be tough, you know, and, and, you know, here we are in Advent and I was, you know, so sort of, you know, compelled by the readings last Sunday, um, when I was at mass, you know, 
sitting with this and I actually did start to think about our work and it, and it, it, it ultimately is all about hope, I think, because for me, it is a reality that is still with us. You know, abuse is still with us and clericalism is still with us. But I feel like I've come away from the study with a deeper understanding that can translate into different, asking different questions, uh, praying in different ways, talking to my priest friends and colleagues differently, um, being more open about certain things and being more cautious about other things, you know, and being able to sort of navigate my life in the church, both as a person of faith, a person who is committed to the gospel and as a theologian, um, in ways that are just more sensitive to the reality of abuse and all of the factors that surround it. Um, and, and while also feeling challenged to not let things slide by, you know, whenever I see some of the stuff that we talked about, you know, if I, if I am in a place where I encounter the things that we talked about, these symptoms of clericalism and, and things just, I don't think we can just let stuff go by. Um, we have to disrupt the status quo. We have to ask these questions. And I think that's part of the sort of prophetic vocation of a theologian to do that already. And I think that's been sort of heightened and sharpened and refined and uh, nuanced for me in, in some really important ways from doing this work. Yeah, no, I would agree. Um, you know, we've been doing this for a long time now, <laughs> um, over two years, uh, almost three years. Yeah. And uh, and there are de definitely many days when, when I thought I, I want to do something else and not this anymore um, because it's painful to walk through this uh, because we love the church. Um, but, um, but I stayed stay in in the room on this and also on the National Review Board, which, um, which is also difficult. Uh, be yeah, because because I think uh, we have something. I really do think we have something to contribute. Um, and so that's important to me, but also I feel, I think I have felt, um, energized by the work and, 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 um, compelled to do something. So if, if clericalism is a reality in the church that I could as a lay person be complicit with, then my, you know, the antidote to that is I have to be responsible. Right. And, and that sometimes that's challenging, but but sometimes it's just taking responsibility, not assuming um, that uh, the priest who comes to dinner is going to say the blessing, right? <laughs> um, not assuming that I can't be the one to gather people in prayer or or um, or other things that 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 we just kind of assume priests have to do, even if that's not the rule, um, knowing that I can um, that I can be professor professor, dean, et cetera, to, in, in my context. And that that's, um, as much as that is, has, that's a role that has a lot of annoying details in it. It's also probably a, an important role uh, to take up. That's what I, I, in my context, can do. And I have the opportunity also as, as a formator, um, which is not something I would have called myself a couple of years ago, um, but of students who will be working in these contexts to, um, to, sh to share this and to help them go even further in a direction I think most of them are already drawn to going in and, and to learn from them also how to, um, how to be a better lay person um, in the church. Julian Paul. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the wonderful conversation. Um, Beyond Bad Apples is uh, freely accessible online, and I encourage our listeners to read and reflect on it, uh, confronting and thinking about the reality of sexual abuse in the church is painful, but really necessary work, I think. And this study adds an important voice to the conversation. And thank you everyone for tuning in. New Wine, New Wine Skin's contributions to the Catholic Moral Theology blog continue for another week, but there will be a brief break during the Christmas holidays. I will see you back in January with a brand new episode of the Conversations in Moral Theology. Many blessings and goodbye.